There are those who suggest that life on Earth began out there, among the stars. Well, not the stars, too bloody hot. Among the planets and asteroids scattered throughout the cosmos. With building blocks of life that may have been the forebearers of proteins, biopolymers, and peptides. Some believe there may still be the stuff of life floating around space, searching for a planet or moon where they can, once again, ignite the process we call life. Pondering Panspermia with Brian Selznick, author of Big Tree. Welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. I'm James Maynard. This week we are pondering panspermia. This notion presents the idea that life on Earth may have been delivered to our world in whole or in part by asteroids and comets. The same process could also potentially spark life throughout the universe. Now, a handful of macroscopic forms of life, like this lovable tardigrade over here, seem to be quite adept at living in space, and some research suggests that certain microscopic life forms might survive both the harsh conditions of space as well as entry into our atmosphere. A variation of this idea, soft panspermia, suggests that instead of life itself, comets and meteorites may have delivered the building blocks of life, including amino acids, to our young world. Yo, amino acid. So, amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. These organic compounds are characterized by a side chain of atoms distinguishing each type of amino acid. Now there are about 20 different types of amino acids commonly found in proteins. These molecules linking together into long chains called polypeptides can fold into complex structures forming functional proteins which are essential for all life on Earth. Now these same amino acids also appear to be common in space. Samples collected from the asteroids Ryugu contain amino acids and water, making the possibility of at least soft panspermia more likely. Earth coalesced out of a disk of gas and dust about four and a half billion years ago and then was whacked by a Mars-sized body forming a moon. What remained of our planet was basically molten magma. If you're looking for a place to set up new life, that wouldn't be your first choice. This was called the Hadian Eon. I quite enjoyed it if I'm being honest. Fire, brimstone, ah. Those were the days. However, biologists currently place the beginning of life on our world somewhere around 4 billion years before our time. That only leaves about 500 million years for our planet to go from a hellish lava ball to igniting the first sparks of life. Now, either our planet is weird, which it is by the way, more on our next week's show, Crazy Cosmos, with Emily Fago from National Geographic, or life quickly springs up anywhere conditions are not hideously, horribly, horrifically horrendous. If that's the case and life ignites quickly in most places, we might expect extraterrestrial life to be far more common around the cosmos than most people imagine. Get back to panspermia. That's why this, I'm this here. This connects, trust me. So how did life connect, kick off on Earth so quickly? Panspermia, now available in regular and soft flavors, suggests living things got a kick start when primitive life forms or the building blocks thereof were delivered to our nascent planet by asteroids and comets. Now, even if precursors to life found their way to Earth, questions still remain of how they bonded together in intricately complex forms, developing the abilities for replication and metabolism, which are among the hallmarks of life. Mm -hmm. Now, winding the clock backward even further presents the next logical question. 
if primitive life or the earliest precursors to life on Earth came from comets and asteroids, where did those bodies come from? Now, most of the objects to strike Earth were first formed in our solar system along with our home world. Some, however, may have journeyed from other star systems far beyond our family of planets, like the seeds of a dandelion which can travel kilometers from the patch of land where they form, these harbingers of life might tra traverse light years before finding a home where they can bring forth the light and the endless possibilities of life. Next up, we talk with Brian Selznick, author of Big Tree. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we are happy to be joined by Brian Selznick. He is an author and illustrator of children's books, and his new book, Big Tree, just came out and uh, has a fascinating premise to it. Welcome to the show, Brian. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here with you today. Thank you. Um, so can you tell us just a little bit about the book, give us some intro to it, and tell us what inspired it? Yeah, it's it's a 600-page book with about 300 pages of pictures, so it moves pretty quickly, mm -hmm. about two little sycamore seeds, uh, Merwin and Louise, who are trying to find a safe place to grow while uh, simultaneously potentially having to save the entire world. And it we discover early on uh, that the story takes place at the very end of the Cretaceous era, right before the asteroid hits the planet that destroys most life on Earth. So there's a very strong time limit that they are working uh, against and a real existential threat that I chose because it felt like a good metaphor for the existential threat that our planet is facing today. And uh, the... The story has a very unusual um, genesis. Um, most of my books are based on things I've wanted to write about or ideas that I've had that have gestated for a long time. But this is the first uh, book that I've ever made where the idea came from someone else. And the idea came from Steven Spielberg. It's a uh, of ideas. <laughs> <laughs> he has a lot of ideas. And he um, had seen the movie of Hugo and read the book, um, which I had written, The Invention of Hugo Cabret, and turned out he was a big fan, and uh, which just in itself was wonderful to discover. But right. he wanted me to write a movie for him. And so he flew me across the country to uh, Los Angeles, and I met with him. And he wanted to tell a, a story about nature from nature's point of view, because he realized he'd never seen a movie made like that, where it's really, plants are the main characters. Right. right. And at first I didn't really think this was entirely possible. <laughs> uh, and I, and I uh, thought maybe that's why no one's made this movie before, because it may not be possible. Mm -hmm. uh, and I worked on this with uh, him and another co-producer named Chris Melodandry for a couple of years, and then the pandemic hit. And when the pandemic hit, uh, for various reasons, it became clear very quickly that the movie was never going to happen, uh, which is the fate of most potential movies. Most of them never get made. But right, right. I've been work I've been working on the story for a couple of years. I had conceived of Merwin and uh, his sister Louise and the asteroid and the Cretaceous period and the adventures that they would go on and the voices they would hear. And I had really fallen in love with the story. And by the time the pandemic hit, it felt even more relevant. Like it felt, the story felt even more connected to things that we were experiencing and what was going on in the world. 
And so I asked uh, Spielberg and Melodandry if I could have permission to take the story that we had conceived of as a film and turn it into a book. And they very enthusiastically said yes. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a very unusual case where the 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 book that I mean it was literally it was just published yesterday um, right. is yeah, is the culmination of a very unexpected series of events, but it feels like in the end, this is actually the form it was always meant to take because I wasn't doing any drawings for the movie, but I, I'm an illustrator as well. So I got to do all of the pictures in the book. And I really feel like this is the way the story was meant to be told. When Spielberg finally read the finished book, he agreed and was uh, and called me on the phone to tell me how much he loved it. So that was very, very satisfying. And so now the fact that the book, like the seeds going out into the world and the story is itself going out to all of these places that are, you know, far and wide and places I've never been, may never go is uh, very exciting. Right, right. Yeah, I'm just thinking about, you know, having read, you know, read the book, it's like, you know, the medium I would love to see this in is a video game. Oh, that's interesting. It reminds me, you know, you have, you know, you start out with just being a seed and, you know, taking your first little steps in the wind yeah. and, you know, the fire, baby. I'm not going to give away too much, you know, <laughs> but, uh, but I think that would be fascinating to play characters like Louise or Merwin. Yeah. Well, I think one of the fun things about immersive video games is it allows us to feel like we're living entirely within another world. Like I've right. I've always been very interested in virtual reality and yeah, I love watching virtual reality yeah. movies and being inside virtual reality experiences. And, and I think in a lot of ways, the goal for any book, whether it's illustrated or whether it's just in writing, is to give actually give you that same feeling. We want you to feel like you are inside this world. And because I draw and because, you know, Big Tree is illustrated with, as I said, like 300 pages of pictures, yeah. it gives you another way to get lost inside the story. And right. so, right. yeah, so, so there's lots of white space where text is highlighted by itself. There's big chunks of text. There's long sequences where we just follow the narrative through pictures. So, so hopefully when and i think we've all experienced this with books that we love we in the end have the same type of feeling we have within a video game where we are immersed within a world that uh is compelling to us and hopefully uh sometimes we actually might learn some things about ourselves and about the world from the story that we've been immersed in mm. and louise and merwin seem to me to have this at least again, have this like child childlike wonder, you know this this world view of of childhood, you know the way we we I think most of us uh, began to understand the world, and I'm wondering how your own childhood influenced those characters. Yeah, you know, I grew up in a very uh, stable household in New Jersey. Uh, I was the oldest of uh, three siblings. Yeah. And uh, we had a nice backyard and there was a little like woods in the right off my backyard of undeveloped land that after a couple of years was torn down and houses were put up. But, you know, I got to like I got to have the experience of going into that little forest and feeling the change of temperature and air and the sounds change and the feeling changes. And it was a little dangerous because I didn't know if there were like jaguars and tigers somewhere in the woods. <laughs> and so Lions, that, that tigers and bears. Oh my. Oh my. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, and so like, and I drew all the time and I, I lost myself in the, in stories I made up. I, mm -hmm. I read a lot when I was a kid. So I was very much, I was very interested in, these types of stories and then and then figuring out in a lot of ways figuring out the world through the way I drew it like and mm. and the and the way that I could draw so when I was working on Big Tree and I was thinking about the characters of Merwin and Louise you know Merwin even though they're both seeds in the same seed ball so they're essentially the same age Merwin acts like the older brother and Louise is a little bit like a little sister and Merwin is very rigid in his thinking. He knows what mama told them to do and they're going to do it. He is interested in rules and regulations and not doing anything wrong. And Louise is just dreamy and the dreamer, hears yeah. voices yeah. and is curious about the world. 
And I realized that those are actually both sides of me that are always in, you know, co competition. And I think as I've gotten older, I hope that Louise is winning, right? Like I want right, Louise right, to win right. in that yeah. in that argument. And so big tree in a way is a reminder that we need to let the side of us that's Louise, who wants to be open to the world and listen and be curious, uh, that we need to let her win a little bit more. Hmm. Hashtag Team Louise. <laughs> <laughs> I want a T-shirt. I want a T-shirt that says that. <laughs> um, so, why seeds? Well, uh, that was a question that I found myself asking very early on because I knew I wanted to tell the story with everything based in science. So, right. you know, the idea was to tell a story about plants from the plants' point of view. So, the so the main characters had to be plants, and so we could have had a, the main character be a tree and maybe the tree would get up and walk around on its roots because the main character is going to have to go do things, but trees can't get up and walk around on their roots. And because, <laughs> I, you know, yeah. And so because I wanted to keep it scientific, mm -hmm. I thought the only kind of characters that I could really have that could move around, I mean, maybe a leaf, but, but I thought seeds, yeah, you know, seeds yeah. move around. Plus there's so many metaphors with childhood, right? Like, you know, the seeds grow, they get, you know, they have a mama tree, they get planted, they grow. There's there's really clear metaphors for what seeds have to do and what children have to do. And, and that interested me. And so that's how I landed on the idea of making the main character seeds. That's great. And so this episode is about the idea of panspermia, the idea that life everywhere, including Earth, may have come from elsewhere. We know we found every single amino acid needed for life in asteroids. And so I'm curious if the idea of uh, panspermia um, occurred to you at all while you were writing this book. It was literally, with that word, brought up by Steven Spielberg in the first meeting. Really? That's great. Yes. So he, I think maybe at some point I had heard about it. I don't think so. Mm. But he was very intrigued by that idea. And yeah. so that that lodged in my imagination. And so in Big Tree, there's actually a moment where the Earth and a passing asteroid have a conversation. And and the at the beginning of essentially, practically the big, beginning of time, and the asteroid offers this gift, and 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 the and the gift is life. And so again, everything in my book is anthropomorphized. Right. And right. and so the characters are they're all speaking English. I mean, if you read <laughs> it in translation, it could be in other languages, but they're reading, they're speaking in whatever language you speak, uh, hopefully at some point. But the idea that life came from outer space and was brought to the earth is in 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 big tree represented as a kind of love story and mm. that um and then and then that hopefully will encourage people to find the science because at the back of uh big tree i have a big section about the real science and i don't think i use that specific word but the idea that life came from the asteroids is gone i go into that in um in depth in the in the back of the book right right um, or at least the building blocks of life, if not life itself. Right. Yeah. You know, Which is so fascinating. It really is. I, I think it's even more fascinating because it becomes more likely. Mm. But um, I'm wondering how, how do books like Big Tree help readers who feel different from others where Real, how do how does it help people relate to to the world around them? Well, I mean, I think that's one of the that's actually one of like the secret weapons of books right. is that, and I think that's why so many people are afraid of books, and that's why books are being banned right now is because of the fear of understanding other people. It's the fear of actually seeing the world from another perspective, and so much of Big Tree is about the importance of listening. Again and again, characters are told that they have to listen, characters refuse to listen, 
Tragedy happens because characters refuse to listen. Mm -hmm. and, and, and when the big lessons come, and I mean, and then again, like I, by lessons, I don't mean like there's a lesson of this book. I mean, the things that the characters have to discover are because they have opened themselves up to listening in a way that they were never open to before. And, and again, I didn't write this as a lesson. I didn't write this as a, as a way to like teach anybody anything. I was just trying to make up a good story. Right. But looking back at what I've written, I realize that there's so much about listening because I need to remember that. I need to remember that I have to be open to other people's points of view. I have to be willing to meet people where they are so that they can hear me. If I want someone to hear what I have to say, I have to be willing to listen to what they have to say. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's really hard. And so, so much of what can happen in a book is it can allow you to feel empathy for people who are different from you. And that's, I think, a big part of what is is happening with these two little seeds in in Big Tree. It's it's about listening and about feeling empathy or or, or learning empathy, right? It's really hard to learn empathy, yeah, right. but it's possible. And that's and that's what I think books in general, at the at in the in the in the best ways, are capable of doing better than almost any other technology. Because books are a, an amazing technology, um, and and when they're deployed, they obviously can make people nervous. Mm -hmm. Right. All right. Well, thanks so much for being on the show, Brian. It was great fun talking with you. Thank you so much. It was really great to talk to you, and hope everyone enjoys Big Tree. Excellent. And that was Brian Selznick, author of the new book Big Tree. Go and check it out wherever you get your awesome books. Panspermia is an idea with quite a history. I'm the Greek philosopher Anaxagoras, and I first coined the term panspermia almost 2,500 years ago. Wow! Has it been that long already? The word panspermia means seeds everywhere, just like Brian's book. They tell me that panspermia is now becoming more accepted by scientists in your time. I guess the seeds of my idea about the seeds of life spreading everywhere are now spreading everywhere. I call it metapanspermia. So far we have only an extremely limited view of what constitutes biological life. Every microorganism, every flower is the product of evolution on a single world, Earth. For now, this limited view prevents us from testing the idea of panspermia experimentally. Now, uh, once we discover alien biologies and study their genetic makeup, we'll be able to test these ideas for the first time. We may quite possibly find their underlying chemical nature is based on the same chemicals and molecular patterns we find in our own bodies. Such a finding would radically alter idea, our ideas of our place in the universe, Notions that the cosmos was created solely for the benefit of one species, nation, or religious affiliation would quickly recede, replaced by realizations of a universe teeming with an unimaginable diversity of life. Next week on The Cosmic Companion, we're going to bring you for a tour of some of the strangest objects in our crazy cosmos, from black holes to a diamond the size of Earth and beyond. We're going to be joined by National Geographic's Emily Fago talking about Nat Geo's new work, That's Factastic. Make sure to join us starting on the 6th of May. Sign up for our mailing list at thecosmiccompanion.com and see each episode as they're released. While you're at it, feel free to share, comment, send vast sums of money, whatever. It's all good. Clear skies.